Imagine you are faced with an enemy you cannot defeat. Mongol tribes, descendants of the great Genghis Khan. Fast, ferocious, hungry, determined to take what they want and spare no one. The question is, what are you going to do? Where in all this madness is my army? It is 1550, and China's richest dynasty is powerless in the face of terror. We need a defensive solution. If you can come up with that, they might just listen. From the ranks of the common soldier comes a hero. His name is Qi Jiguang. And this is the story of his vision to protect his nation. With the greatest defensive structure ever built. This will be unlike anything seen before. A living, breathing entity. The Great Wall of China. Yet the empire which invested its hope and resources in its greatest creation would ultimately fall. Betraying the general who created it, taking for granted the sweat and willpower of the common soldiers who manned it, trusting the politicians who never believed in it, forgetting that the wall itself would only be as strong as the people behind it. Five centuries later, the secrets of the wall are being brought to light for the very first time. This way is not about bricks. The texts that reveal the genius of its creator. The people whose ancestors built it and are now rediscovering their heritage. The Great Wall means so much to the Chinese people now. The modern army, founded by Qi Jiguang, is now allowing us to study its origins for the first time. And in parts of the wall never filmed before, the very earth, stones and bricks themselves finally tell their story. It is September 1550 in the forbidden city Beijing, imperial capital of the richest, most advanced empire of the age. Among the officer cadets taking their martial arts exams is 23-year-old Qi Zhiguang, the man who will one day build the Great Wall. <laughs> Today, his more modest goal is to become an officer in the Imperial Army. to a military family. His father spent his life fighting the Mongols on the northern border. And for generation after generation, son has followed father in a seemingly endless guerrilla war. Chi knows that if he passes his exams, he can expect to follow the same path. but his destiny is about to be changed. A 
few kilometers north, Mongol horsemen cross the border. But this is not a border raid. Heading straight for Beijing is an invasion force, 100,000 strong. The outer suburbs of Beijing are quickly overrun. And every man in the city is mobilized for defense. Tens of thousands of Chinese already lie dead. Citizens are fleeing in panic to the gates of the Forbidden City. In the heart of the palace, the sound reaches the ears of the Emperor Jia Jing. It is the sound of humiliation, his own citizens terrorized, screaming for safety. the city gates. Let as many in as we can take. This way. The sound of war. The sound I've waited to hear for so long. But this is not glorious battle. This is shameful, a disaster. How could this happen? The Mongols haven't yet reached the Forbidden City itself. But the fact that they've got this close means something somewhere has gone seriously wrong. One of the things designed to protect the capital was a wall. a defensive barrier which had stood for centuries. In fact, for almost 2,000 years since China's first emperor, successive dynasties had built walls to keep out and hold back the Mongols. And not just around Beijing, but all across the north of China. For thousands of kilometers, the land became studded with hundreds of pieces of wall a uniquely Chinese solution to the age-old Mongol threat. Historian David Spindler has been studying the evolution of the Great Wall and the forces that shaped it. One of these forces is the Mongol people. Spindler has traveled over a thousand kilometers from Beijing to the wild west of China. 500 years ago, this was the border with Mongol territory, and until very recently, still closed to foreigners. Spindler wants to know how the border was guarded in 1550 and understand the nature of the force that threatened it. His research has brought him to the town of Sharko, a perfectly preserved time capsule that was once a Ming border town, 
and as their first ever Western visitor, Spindler is given a formal civic reception. These are the last traces of a Mongol culture that once defined this border region. They dance to the freedom of the horsemen on the steppe, a wild, romantic and dangerous presence. A presence forged in century after century of uneasy coexistence with their Chinese neighbors. Local historian Han Jiang Cheng explains how the region was defended against Mongol attacks. The first surprise is how few soldiers were ever housed in this garrison to cover a vast stretch of border. This really wasn't a, a massive garrison force by Ming Dynasty standards. There were originally supposed to be about 500 men garrisoned in this little fort right here. And the purpose of those men was to supply people for border defense all along the wall and to serve as, as a reservoir of people to uh, go out to hot spots along the wall when they were attacked. But the bigger surprise is the wall itself. This is it. No bricks, no mortar. A lot different from the wall that most people think of. This wall is made of rammed earth, layers of tamped earth on top of each other. It was really just a thin, high earth wall. The defenders couldn't get on top of it to fight off the Mongols. So the main purpose of it was just to slow the Mongol attack. Spindler has discovered that raids here as elsewhere along the wall were not military invasions. They were large-scale hit-and-run heists. For the Mongols, their power lay in their speed and surprise. There would have been several tens of Mongols, maybe several hundreds of Mongols, they'd come to the border, dig open a section of this rammed earth wall, and then they would amass all things that the Mongols wanted and needed, but couldn't produce in their own economy. It really was like a mugging. They were there very quickly. The next minute, they were gone. And at that point, the, the Chinese really had a very hard time fighting back. Though Mongol raids affected thousands of kilometers of frontier, the combination of walls and garrison soldiers had always been just enough to contain an essentially local problem. But in the great Mongol assault on Beijing in 1550, the problem stopped being local and set in motion a sequence of events that would turn this into this. September 1550, and the suburbs of Beijing burn. Inside the Forbidden City, the government is in turmoil. There were meant to be walls and a vast army to protect them. Both seem to have failed. And there is one man who demands an explanation. What a miracle! None of you has run away! The Emperor Jia Jing. I have had to listen to my people begging to be let into the city because they fear for their lives. I have had barbarians banging on the ending gate, the so-called gate of safety and security, demanding ransom for my life. I have been humiliated in my own court 
by your failure. And I have had enough. Now, I want some answers. No one is in a hurry to offer an explanation because no one knows how the Mongols broke through. Get up, all of you! If they had, the sense of embarrassment would be even greater. David Spindler has come to Beijing to see how and where the Mongols breached the city's defenses. For the last 15 years, he's traced every part of the original walls, matching each section to historical accounts of the attack. The line of wall runs 100 kilometers north of the capital, and manned by the Imperial Army, had for centuries been thought adequate to withstand any threat. Uh, we're in a little valley just on the Mongolian side of the wall. Early in the day on September 26, 1550, several thousand Mongols attacked the main river valley just to our east here at Gubekal. But that was really a typical Mongol maneuver. It was a diversionary feint. And what the Mongols did later that day was to spread disinformation that they were going to attack through a pass far to the northwest of here. The Chinese believed that, and what the Mongolians did was they simply sent a small commando unit up this valley. Their purpose was to get through the Chinese wall and get behind the main group of Chinese defenders and, as it were, unlock the door and let the main Mongol force in. This is it, the only thing separating Mongolia and China. The Mongols came through here, several hundred Mongols broke over this wall, picked it apart with picks and shovels. One raider later said that getting in here was as easy as walking into a room. And that's just what they did. They went over this ridge here, around back behind the Chinese defenders, routed them, and then thousands of Mongols poured into the Beijing suburbs. The Chinese casualties are very heavy. 60,000 Chinese killed, 40,000 taken prisoner, hundreds of thousands of head of livestock were lost. We could call it the, the September 11th of this period of Ming history. Not only has the wall proved inadequate to withstand Mongol attack, there is no sign of the great imperial army that is meant to repel them. Where in all this madness is my army? Where are the soldiers who are supposed to be protecting the city? Where is the minister for war? Because clearly we are in the middle of one. We assume he's fighting the Mongols, Highness. You assume? Go fight him! Everyone is so preoccupied with the scale of the disaster, no one has yet thought to ask why the Mongols are here. Meanwhile, a figure arrives at the Forbidden City. It is not the returning Minister of War, 
but a Chinese prisoner sent to the emperor by the mastermind of the attack, Mongol leader Altan Khan. A year ago, the Khan demanded diplomatic recognition and trading rights for his people. The request was arrogantly dismissed. His envoys killed. Now with Mongol forces looting the suburbs of Beijing, the power balance has fundamentally shifted. The question is, does the imperial court, which has always lived in a precious world of its own, understand this new reality? What is this? What is this? I was a prisoner of the Khan. I've been sent with a message from His Serene Highness. A prisoner of the Khan with a message for Your Serene Highness. Why did you not die defending the Emperor? But I had no weapon. What do they want? It's a request to pay tribute to Your Highness. In effect, a demand for trade. I know what that means. No! And it's in Chinese. Well? Surely, if this is a formal request from the Khan himself, it should be in Mongolian. We might easily doubt its authenticity, especially as it's come without an official Mongol envoy. Perhaps. We should send it back. Can we do that? We might perhaps be able to buy ourselves some time. Yes. Send it back. Let's have the bear dance to our tune for a change. Reinflating the Emperor's damaged ego. Ministers demand the Khan resubmits his request for trade in the appropriate language, meanwhile assuming that the army will soon come to their rescue. It never does. By early October, the Mongols have gone. But having made the point they came to make, they have simply left of their own accord. And as is painfully obvious to Qi Jiguan, the Chinese are powerless to prevent them returning any time they choose. It is a humiliation he will never forget. Pick him up. It is clear to Qi that the great imperial army is not fit for purpose. In fact, of the 140,000 soldiers listed in Greater Beijing, barely half had been assigned to active duty. The Minister of War had avoided confronting Mongol forces he knew were vastly superior to his own, an inconvenient fact the court chooses to overlook. So, according to the Ming history, the Minister of War, Yang Shouqian, was considered to have committed a crime and was cast away in the marketplace, which means that he was executed. So, the Minister of War was the scapegoat for this debacle. In China's National Archive, Professor Robin Yates examines the 40,000 pages of the Ming Dynasty's own records. To try to answer a question which has long occupied historians, how the richest dynasty in China's history could lack a credible defense. 
the Ming Empire, in fact, was relatively successful. And as a consequence, people started to become interested in uh, money and becoming merchants, and uh, the military were disdained. And so when Qi was born, the military system of the Ming was in steep decline. Nobody wanted to become a soldier. But this was exactly the point, because of the wealth of the Ming, that foreigners, such as the Mongols, wanted to get a, a bit of the action themselves. So just at the point when the Ming was being successful, then it was under the greatest threat. For Qi Jiguang, the question is what to do about it. If this is to be ended, then we must put up a real fight. Not just here, but out there. They must be taught a lesson that can be felt from here to the edges of the world. Robin Yates has found references in Chi's biography suggesting he had turned his fighting impulse into a coherent strategy. And Yates believes that at this stage, it had little to do with building walls. Chi had come up with more than 10 strategies to drive out the Mongols. But unfortunately, there is nothing which tells us what those 10 plans were. And there's nothing in the Ming history either. So why is this? I think that the reason is that uh, his plans were far too uh, forceful. I think he wanted to go and have an active attack plan, offensive plan, against the Mongols. At court, they have other ideas. Realizing that they have no adequate defense, the government decides to give in to Mongol demands. And a series of trade deals is drawn up to appease Altan Khan. The man given the job of getting the emperor to sign them is a young government secretary, Zhang Zhuzhong. Secretary Zhang, I set a plan for the emperor's approval. Has he read it yet? No, but I have. Are you keeping it from him? No. I'd like him to read it, just as I'd like him to read rather more important documents. I hardly think you have the rank to judge that, Master Chang. May I have it back, please? You forget yourself, Master Chi. And the folly of an impetuous war. I think I know about warfare. But you don't know about the court. A plan for an all-out war will not find favor, nor the money to make it happen. We need a defensive solution. Now, if you can come up with that, they might just listen. Chi knows that whatever they choose to call the solution, it will need a better army than the one they have. In the meantime, Zhang takes the appeasement deal to be signed by the emperor. These are papers for His Highness to sign. Important treaties. Please tell His Highness. The Emperor, however, now has his mind elsewhere. Having executed the war minister, he returns to his normal daily routine, taking drugs and having sex with as many concubines as possible. Your Highness, if I could interrupt for the briefest of moments. Zhang begins to realize that it may take a while to get the deals signed. And even then, trade alone may not protect them for long. They will still be at the mercy of Mongol aggression, unable to reject any future demands. 
he starts to see the value of a maverick, someone not yet corrupted by the failures of the system. A soldier, perhaps, with vision. He begins to reevaluate Chi Ji Guang. Given time, could he be the man to rebuild the nation's defense? If he is, Zhang knows he will have to prove his leadership skills first. In the spring of 1555, Qi finds himself over a thousand kilometers from the Mongol border with a new challenge, to rid the country of Japanese pirates. After Qi's 10-point plan had been rejected by the court, you know, he was pretty much in limbo. But then the Japanese pirates started raiding all the way along the coast, and the court decided, well, you know, why don't you try Qi Ji Guang? Send him down, see if he can fix the problem. It's not where he wants to be. Yet it is here that Qi's first step on the road to building the Great Wall will be taken by creating a completely new kind of army. It is 1555. For four years, trade deals have kept the Mongol border relatively quiet. While China's south coast is in turmoil. For hundreds of kilometers, Japanese pirates loot and plunder coastal settlements. And so far, all military responses have come to nothing. Now, Qi Jiguang has been given the chance to succeed where others have failed. And the man who will one day build the Great Wall is about to lay its foundations by creating an army able to defend it. On paper, there are 120,000 men to fight the Japanese. But they are men like Gangzhou. As local farmers, Zhou's family has owed military service to the district governor for generations. And so, like many others, he's listed as a soldier in the official records. That's all? Everyone is here. Give me those papers. And the weapons? Where are all the weapons they're supposed to have? This is all we have, sir. Have any of you ever fought the Japanese with these weapons? No, oh, sir. We're farmers. My orders say you're soldiers. We're not trained to be soldiers. Then you will be. Get them to the barracks. Start tomorrow. Not paid to be soldiers. And you will be that too. Chi Ji Guang realized that the military organization of the Ming really could not solve the problem. And so what he decided to do was to take and train a group of peasants and use this manual to train them to fight against the Japanese. These original texts are one of China's greatest historical treasures. Written by Qi Jiguang himself as an instruction book for creating a modern professional army. In them, Every step of his soldier's training is written out in common Chinese language and illustrated for easy learning. It was a very, very carefully thought out plan to use the, the skills, the native skills of the ordinary farmers, coupled with 
and the latest military technology. He then trained essentially an army of 3,000 men who were completely devoted to him. And it was known as Chi's uh, family army. The measure of his success is this. The People's Liberation Army, the largest standing army in the world. And 400 years after Qi Jiguang, it still calls itself the Great Wall of Iron and Steel. Robin Yates has come to meet serving military commander General Zhao Xin at his base in central China. The first time a Western academic has been allowed into the heart of China's military. But Zhao is also an historian and wants to share his insights on the man he regards as the founder of the modern Chinese army. Five hundred of Zhao's men demonstrate part of their basic training, collective martial arts a practice that began with Qi Jiguan. General Zhao basically feels that there were sort of three main elements to Qi Jiguang's uh, um, achievements. And the first is, in a sense, creating a people's army. The second is the importance of uh, the training, making sure that the individual obeyed the commanding officer. So his eyes, his ears, his heart, his legs, his limbs, all of them were working for the commanding officer. The third point is that all of these men have to work as a unit. And the modern Chinese army has to be trained in the same way. The uh, morale or the spirit, the technology and uh, the physical training has to work all together. And Qi Jiguang's main uh, achievement was linking all these three elements to create a sort of new modern army. Qi knew that a viable army would be the first essential part of any national defense. And though he could not see it, the first foundation stone in the Great Wall But laying that foundation would not be easy. On one recorded occasion, trying to retake a position from Japanese pirates, Chi faces defeat. Knowing that for his new army to succeed, discipline is everything. Chi must decide how far he is prepared to go to instill that discipline. specifies very, very clearly is that you cannot have a single soldier turn his head and a single soldier be afraid. Because that will affect the discipline, the morale of the entire unit. And so, as a soldier, he orders that uh, anybody who does that, who turns their head, will be cut down immediately, especially their officers. Stop! Why are you inside? Turn around and fight! Who gave the order to stop? The leaders said we can't do it. They're better than us. Now, stop there! Well, you can die like dogs, or you can fight like men. But you don't run. Now move! Let's go! The 
skill and discipline Chi instills in his army leads to victory after victory of the Japanese. The first solid success for nearly a century against either of China's military threats. And while the enemy in the south is being vanquished, the enemy in the north has returned. The Mongols are back. For years, the old emperor tried to back out of his trade deals with the Mongols without the defenses to withstand the backlash. Once more, those defenses have failed, and once more, the outskirts of Beijing are being plundered. Tens of thousands have been slaughtered. The job of responding to the renewed threat now falls to Minister Zhang Zhuzhong. I will, of course, keep you duly informed. And now there is a new and inexperienced emperor on the throne, 31-year-old Long Qing. The emperor brought up in the palace by concubines and eunuchs, completely untested, exactly the moment when, of course, the Mongols could see that this was their opportunity to exert a little more pressure to get what they wanted out of uh, China. Zhang knows they need to solve the Mongol problem once and for all. So he turns to the young soldier he first sponsored 17 years ago, now General Qi Jiguang. In late 1567, having accomplished his mission in the south, Qi returns north to Beijing, the leader of a victorious army. He is now ready to face the ultimate challenge, defeating the Mongols. He recalls his first instinctive response to their savagery. They must be taught a lesson that can be felt from here to the edges of the world. But Qi is no longer sure an army on its own will be enough. In the past, the generals really had decided, well, they thought, you know, if they could just you know, get enough soldiers, get enough cavalry, drive out into the, the steppes, you know, they could defeat the enemy. But the problem was what tended to happen with, uh, with an offensive uh, plan was that the soldiers would ride out, but then after two or three days, they'd run out of supplies and the Mongols could just run around them and uh, cut them down. So uh, Qi realized that you had to have a better system of integrating the different types of forces. Before he reaches Beijing, Qi comes up with the beginnings of a new solution. He first tries to imagine a way of containing the Mongols. Then starts to conceive a structure that will resist attack, but allow his own forces through to engage the enemy. And an image forms. Not just a single wall, but layer upon layer of fortresses connected by walls. A vast defensive network, a new Great Wall complex. What had once been rocks and compacted earth would now be brick and stone. What had once been simple platforms to stand on would now be complex towers Fortresses for his men, storehouses, arsenals, gun platforms, beacons, refuges, home to tens of thousands of soldiers. And where dynasty after dynasty had built pieces of wall to keep out the Mongols, 
Now, finally, in Qi's vision, the Ming wall would be whole. No gaps, no weak links. And built along the most formidable mountain ranges, a man-made fortress on top of a natural barrier. A truly great wall and the most ambitious project in China's history. Three. If there is to be any chance of getting the court to pay for it, Qi and Minister Zhang Zhuzhong must first persuade the emperor. And he has plenty of other solutions on offer. And expeditionary force to evade the step from here and here to teach them a lesson. And we have means to do it with the Chi's army. If we win. But if we launch a war and we lose, what then? With your army gone, we'll have no protection and risk bringing down the wrath of the Khan on us all. Perhaps we should hear from our general about his intentions. Please, General, tell them. My preference is always to attack an enemy. You see? So you agree with the idea of a great offensive campaign? No. I think there's a more effective solution. Rather than chasing after Mongols, we let them come to us. They do it now, and they take what they want! But if next time we make them pay an unacceptable price, we make them think again. It really is just a matter of basic economics. It's more basic than that. If you come to rob my home, and I know you are coming, and I am waiting for you and armed, I can strike you with all my force where I am strong and protected. Therefore, my solution is to use my army, the most powerful army this nation has ever had, as a repulsion force. And where do you put your army, General? Here, in the capital? No, on the wall. The key is hollow towers, 3,000 of them, each one with a platoon of 50 soldiers, each one linked with a signal system of beacons to warn of enemy approach. And who will pay for this new war? And the army on it. Who's paying now? Who's paying for our inability to defend ourselves? This new wall will be unlike anything seen before. It will be a living, breathing entity. Without my men on it, it cannot work. And without it, I cannot protect you. Everyone knows that the cost of building a wall on the scale Qi demands will be astronomical. But offered the possibility of a final solution to the Mongol problem, the emperor gives his consent. The wall will be built. It is 1569, and Qi Jiguang's Great Wall project begins with bricks. Hundreds of new brick factories are hurriedly set up to supply the first phase of tower construction. At the height of production, an average factory is producing half a million bricks a week, requiring five kilos of earth and lime and seven kilos of wood for every one. There is no secret formula to the bricks. Each site must use local materials fired with wood from surrounding forests. But as part of the Great Wall, every single one must be guaranteed of the highest possible quality. 
This brick here says the 12th year of the Wanli reign, which is 1584. Um, and this is Zhen Ding, which is a place in western Hebei, which is the, the place where this military company came from. The inscriptions would give the particulars of that wall building project. And the point of doing that was to hold the people in charge of that project responsible if something happened to that wall uh, in three years, five years, eight years. David Spindler has come to the eastern end of the Great Wall at Shanghai Guan, where 500 years after the wall was built, much of it is being rebuilt. And the repair work gives Spindler the chance to look inside the structure itself to see how it was made. On the interior of the wall, is a, a rammed earth wall. Um, layers and layers of rammed earth, about 15 centimeters thick, uh, were built up to create a wall like what we're seeing here. Now, later on, uh, bricks were used in Ming Dynasty wall construction. And when that was done, the bricks were simply added to the outside of the pre-existing rammed earth wall. These bricks are this size, about 40 centimeters long. And in between the bricks is this Mortar. Mortar is made up of cured lime or slaked lime, uh, cured in a kiln and water. The advantages of using brick as a construction method are that brick is a, is a standard size, easily movable. Um, you can build wall in a variety of terrains. You can build it in steep terrain because you can hold it in place. You can build peepholes. You can build crenellations the U-shaped openings for archers to, to look out of. The brick wall has the advantage of being much more flexible. And to get those bricks to where they can be used, an army of laborers is needed, Qi Jiguang's own army. Gang Zhou started his military career in the south, transformed from peasant farmer to skilled soldier as part of Qi's new model army. Now, like thousands of his comrades, he's on the northern border, assigned to building the wall. 